All right, welcome to the first talk of the 2024-2025 POTUS series. Uh, we're happy to have Reed Bart Barton from Carnegie Mellon University, who will be telling us about directed aspects of condensed type theory. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you, Dan. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very excited to talk about uh, this stuff today. So what I'd like to talk about today is, um, well, it's joint work in progress with my collaborator, Johan Komelin. And we've been interested in um, condensed sets and sort of describing condensed sets and as a, as a theory of spaces and, and doing it in a type theoretic kind of way. And so for the outline for this talk, I wanna begin by talking about just a, giving a quick introduction to what is a condensed set or maybe the higher versions like condensed groupoids, which we'll see occasionally, um, because I assume that most of you have had maybe little to no exposure to condensed sets before. Um, then I'd like to talk about two important classes of maps of condensed sets, which are what we call a tall and proper maps, and those will be explained further on. And then I'll move to uh, describing some axioms that are expressed in like a type theoretic language, uh, describing the topos of condensed sets and specifically uh, the subuniverses of a tall and proper maps. And the main theorem that I'd like to talk about a little bit is a sort of directed univalence theorem for one of the universes that's involved in these uh, type theoretic axioms. And I've written it here as a kind of preview. Uh, what it says is that if I have any two of these types and they belong to the Otis universe, well, there's some kind of type of directed paths from A to B, uh, which is defined in some other way. And the theorem says that that's equivalent to just the type of functions from the type A to the type B. And throughout this talk, I want to emphasize uh, two main analogies, again, for people who are um, maybe less familiar with condensed mathematics or maybe even points at topology. Uh, part of my motivation in giving this talk is I've maybe belatedly come to understand that a lot of what people are doing with directed univalence in other settings, like in, in infinity one categories or in simplicial type theory and so on, it's very closely related and involves many of the same constructions that we're using for condensed sets. Uh, and so uh, rather than try to necessarily understand exactly what's going on in those subjects. I'm hoping to explain my subject to you. And for you, you might find these uh, kinds of analogies helpful. So the first analogy is just that a condensed set is like a topological space, um, but not quite. And the second analogy is that a condensed set is going to have some kind of structure, which is like a simplicial set in, in the same way that a topological space has some structure, which is like a post set or a preorder. Uh, and that Namely, that's the specialization order on a topological space. And for a condensed set, it's not quite a preorder. It's going to be something else that's more like a special set. So those are the kind of analogies I want to carry through this talk. OK, so let's begin with what are condensed sets. Uh, so a quick one slide summary is really the best way to think about it is some kind of approximation of the category of topological spaces by a topos. Um, it was introduced by Klaus and Schulze. Um, and independently, really, by Barwick and Hain to do some slightly related, slightly different thing. And it already, already implicitly appeared in some work by Lurie and probably in other places, but um, Lurie didn't give it any name. So condensed sets is the name from Klaassen and Schulte. Um, and why would we be interested in such a thing? Well, OK, from a type theoretic perspective, uh, an obvious reason is if I wanted to have a, an interpretation of type theory where the types represent topological spaces, I'm kind of stuck because the category of topological spaces is not very good at all. It doesn't, it's not locally Cartesian closed. It doesn't have good exactness properties. So I could fix all of those by just replacing topological spaces by some topos. And that's one thing that the category of condensed sets does. Um, another advantage, which is connected to this, is there's an obvious higher analog of a condensed set, which is a condensed groupoid, whereas there maybe isn't an obvious analog of a topological space that's like a topological groupoid of some kind. Um, or if there is, it might be even more technically awkward to deal with in topological spaces. And the original motivation for something like condensed sets was that, um, well, there is this traditional definition in algebraic geometry of what's called the L-adic cohomology of a scheme. It's some kind of cohomology here where the, the coefficients, they take values in the, in the p-adic numbers, which is a topological field or topological ring, and that topology is somehow important. And there was always a sort of ad hoc definition of this l adic cohomology. But what Bott and Schulze did is show how it can be, 
it can be described also as genuine sheaf cohomology of some object in a topos, where the objects of this topos have a kind of topological structure. So that's what they did in the pro topology paper. And then that later became um, sort of abstracted into the setting of condensed sets. So that's the quick, uh, you know, why do we care about condensed sets? Um, so what actually is a condensed set, I'm giving you a definition. It's not important for the talk, actually. I'm mostly going to talk about topological spaces, but here it is. Uh, we fix a regular cardinal that we are going to use to cut off the sizes of things. And we're going to look in particular at the, the, the pro-completion of the category of finite sets, so, but only for kappa small co-filtered limits. So pro of thin would be the completion where you join all co-filtered limits to the category of finite sets. We're just going to join the kappa small ones. That's nice because that remains a small category. So in the end, we're going to have a growth in the topos. There won't be any concerns about what kind of category we get. And then we're going to take sheaves on that, uh, on that site for the topology, which is generated by finitely jointly effective epimorphisms. Um, and that's a very, what, one reason to give this definition is to show you there's actually no topology in the definition. This is just category theory. Um, it's just stuff about regular and extensive categories and, um, and sheaf theory. So, but in the end, it turns out to be very closely related to topological spaces. So by construction, this condensed, kappa condensed sets, it has as a full subcategory, this, pro, this kappa small pro finite sets. Because it's because kappa condensed sets the sheaves on this pro kappa thin. Um, but on the other hand, topological spaces also has pro finite sets as a full subcategory via stone duality. So pro finite sets are equivalent under stone duality to Boolean algebras or to stone spaces. If I cut off to kappa the sort of kappa small pro finite sets, they correspond to the kappa small Boolean algebras, which are the stone spaces with fewer than kappa open subsets. So we have a full subcategory of kappa condensed sets, which is the pro kappa of thin, and it's also a full subcategory of topological spaces. And kappa condensed sets is sort of built as a free co-completion up to some relations that we preserve among existing pro finite sets. And those relations also uh, hold in topological spaces until we end up with this uh, realization nerve adjunction at the bottom. And what the nerve functor does, is if I have a topological space X, uh, I send it to a profinite, sorry, sends, uh, the nerve is a kappa condensed set. So a condensed set is a functor from profinite sets to ordinary sets. And I send a profinite set S to just the set of all continuous functions from S to X. Now S is viewed as a topological space by just taking the limit of that, of that diagram of profinite sets. Right? And this relationship between kappa condensed sets and topological spaces is actually a very good approximation. So this nerve functor is fully faithful on, on a large subcategory of topological spaces. And I'm just going to identify topological spaces with their nerves, even though it's not always correct to do so. It will be fine for the purposes of today. Okay. So we can also boost the level up one category level, which we're just gonna need a little bit for universes. So kappa condensed sets, those are sheaves of sets on some site. We can also consider stacks of groupoids on the same site. Those are condensed groupoids. And we can build a similar analogy or diagram between condensed groupoids and not topological spaces, but topoi. So topoi, a topos is another kind of space, but topoi really form a two category. If I have a, a morphism of topoi, then the morphism can have automorphisms and I, I can't just ignore them. So if I wanna start with a topos over here and sort of take its nerve as a condensed object, I, I'm forced to keep track of at least the groupoid of maps between topoi. And so I'm forced to end up with at least a condensed groupoid. And that's what I'm gonna do with this nerve construction. So the construction here is that I send a topos E to its nerve and the nerve of a topos E sends a profinite set to, well, the groupoid. So this is, represents the groupoid or the core of the category of morphisms of topoi from sheaves on S to E. And another way to say that is it's the groupoid of E valued sheaves on S. So this is also a way to take a topos and convert it into a condensed groupoid in general, if the topos was 
you know, something where there are automorphisms. Uh, so this is just a very quick way that condensed sets fits in other, uh, you know, how it connects to topological spaces and to topos theory. Um, but actually, in order to talk about the kinds of structure that I'm interested in condensed sets, I'm going to assume that, um, well, I'd like to start out with uh, not talking about condensed sets themselves, but just, just talk about topological spaces. So, so, yeah, so this section, sorry, is, I guess, a tall and proper maps of condensed sets, but they're going to be analogous to certain classes of uh, topological spaces, namely local homeomorphisms and proper maps of topological spaces. So I'm going to start with those instead. So here's the story for topological spaces. And if you know about topoi, you can do a similar story for topoi. It's also, I think, quite illuminating, but I assume that topological spaces will be more familiar to most people, and it's just actually also much easier to do calculations. So the, the beginning point of this analogy or this setup is the Sierpinski space. I've got a topological space with two points. I'm going to call one of them the closed point, and that's I've written with this filled in circle. And the other point is the open point that's drawn with an open circle, I guess. And the idea is that the open point is open and the closed point is not open. So the open sets, open subsets are just, well, the empty set, the whole space, and the singleton consisting of the open point. And my picture of this is as an arrow. And this is the first kind of you know, uh, relationship to category theory or partially ordered things. But, this, but, but the definition is just as a topological space, right? So I'm drawing it as an arrow. The arrow goes, goes from a closed point to an open point. Uh, one role that the Sierpinski space plays in topology is as a classifier for open subspaces or open subsets. If I have any topological space X and I look at the maps from X to the Sierpinski space, well, there's just two points. I've got to send some subset of X to the open point. Let's call it U. And the condition that the map is continuous just turns out to mean that the subset U is an open subset and not an arbitrary subset. So in that way, the Sierpinski space is classifying open subspaces or open subsets. But it also has a second role in topology, which is that it's connected to a kind of directed or ordered structure on a topological space, and that's the specialization order. So let me recall this in case it's unfamiliar, which it may be to you, many of you. If I have a topological space and two points, I say that, and the, uh, the terminology here is a little bit awkward. Um, so I say that Q specializes to P, but then we write P arrow Q. And I apologize for this. It's a consequence of uh, conventions that I think are good conventions that the arrow kind of goes in a non-standard or unusual direction. Um, but the definition is the arrow is chosen to go in this direction because the definition now makes it very kind of clear what to do. Um, it just means that any open set that contains P also contains Q. And that's why I think of it as an arrow from P to Q. Um, and by the nature of this definition, it's clear that you know, this relation is transitive because it has the form of an implication. Um, it's also easy to check that this ordering is preserved by continuous maps. And also basically by definition, if I have an open subset of a topological space and it contains P and P is less than to Q, then the open subset must also contain Q. So open subspaces are in particular upwards closed under this relation under this ordering. Um, and one reason this ordering might not be very familiar, uh, depending on what kind of point set topology you've seen, is that if I have a house door space, then any two points P and Q, I can separate by disjoint open sets. So neither one is contained in every open subset contained in the other one, and this ordering is sort of trivial and boring. And so it doesn't say anything. You know, there's no purpose to introducing this for you know, real analysis and things like this. It shows up in algebraic geometry, notably because in algebraic geometry, people tend to use a lot of non house door spaces. So an example of a specialization, we have to look at some strange space. So maybe the Sierpinski space is good. Well, in the Sierpinski space, the closed point, uh, I guess, generalizes to, we could say, the open point. Because right, that means that every, every open subset containing the closed point also contains the open point, which you can just check from the list of open subspaces from before. So that's an example of a specialization or a generalization, we could say. And it's actually the universal one. So if I have any space X, then giving a map from the Sierpinski space into X now, it's the same as giving 
two points because the Spitzky space has two points. And then you can check that for the map that's defined that way to be continuous. It ends up just meaning the same thing as that, uh, well, Q specializes to P or that Q is a, or yes. So P is the closed point and Q is the open point. Um, right, so as I've written it here. So really the Sierpinski space has two different roles simultaneously. It's on the one hand, it's the classifier for open propositions. On the other hand, it's also a kind of directed interval that I can use to probe somehow the specialization order of some other topological space by mapping out of it. And we're gonna see that again when we go to condensed sets and directed univalence. Okay, so now I wanna move on to what are these two classes of maps about top, of topological spaces that I'm interested in. And the first one is local homeomorphisms. And I haven't drawn any picture, but a local homeomorphism is a map where every point, oh, I see there's a question. If we were right top and bottom for the points in S, which would be which? Great question. Uh, bottom is the closed point and top is the open point. And that's the reason, well, okay, that has to be the convention because the ordering should be that bottom is less than equal to top. So that's how you can remember that. Um, I don't know if it's, that's, so that's forced by the other kind of conventions that I've chosen. Thanks. And we will write that later on. Right, so a local homeomorphism, it's a map where every point in Y has some neighborhood, which is mapped homeomorphically to some neighborhood of its image in X. And the basic examples of such maps are, first of all, the inclusions of open subspaces, so open embeddings. And secondly, a map to the terminal space, the one point space, that's a local homeomorphism if and only if the space Y is discrete because locally it should look like a point, right? So locally every, every subset has to be open and so on. Um, and more generally, there's a very well-known equivalence of, of uh, local homeomorphisms mapping to a fixed space X with she's on X. And this equivalence is given, I guess, in the, in the right to left, no, I, I switched it around, right? In the left to right direction, if I've given a sheaf, I can build a local homeomorphism, uh, which is, and that's called the atoll space construction. Uh, and we'll see, I guess, an example of how that works in a moment. So what does this have to do with specializations? Well, so I, I claim that there's a, a lifting property involving, on the one hand, I guess, generalizations, meaning I map a closed point into the Sierpinski space, and on the other hand, local homeomorphisms. In other words, if I have a local homeomorphism F, then if I have a point in Y and a generalization of its image in X, that generalization lifts uniquely to a generalization of the original point of Y. And I'm not gonna go through the proof, but it, from the way that I've set up the definitions, it's just, it follows immediately from the way that, that things have been set up. Um, you just look at your specialization or your generalization by definition, a generalization of a point must belong to every open subset that the original point belongs to. And so the local homeomorphism property is gonna give you a specialization upstairs. That's basically the idea. And the next picture I wanna look at is what does it look like if I give a local homeomorphism that's into the Sierpinski space? Well, I told you a moment ago, a local homeomorphism into a space here S that's supposed to be the same by the atoll space construction as a sheaf of sets on the space S. And if you work out what a sheaf on the space S is going to be, it turns out to be just an arrow of the category of sets. So it's got a stock at the closed point and a stock at the open point and a specialization or a, a, a map between them. Um, and it's really just the values of the sheaf on the whole space and the space that contains just the open point respectively. What is the correspondence? Well, if I have an arrow in set, so an object of this set, which I've drawn like this, I can build a local homomorphism over S in the, by the following picture. So I've tried to draw something here. So A, we imagine it's the set with these three points and B is the, the set with these four points. And the function G is indicated by these arrows. But the arrows and the points, they also indicate this is the entirety of a space, which I've written as the sort of mapping cylinder type space. And the arrows in this space, they also represent specializations. And each of those specializations is gonna lie over 
the special, the sort of universal specialization in S. Um, and you can show pretty easily just by hand even that every local homeomorphism over uh, the Sierpinski space has to have this form. Somehow, if I have a point in B, well, it has, you know, it's going to be sent downstairs to the open point. That's an open neighborhood. So that's going to be, you know, this singleton will be homomorphic to the singleton downstairs. But if I have a point in A, I need a, an open neighborhood of its image that's homeomorphic to an open neighborhood upstairs, and that's going to force it to specialize to some point in B. So that's, that's basically showing, explaining why this equivalence of categories holds in this case over the Sierpinski space. So that's the story for local homeomorphisms. And there's kind of a dual maybe story for proper maps. And it might be a little bit less familiar. And one note on terminology, I'm gonna say proper. Whenever I say proper, I mean proper and separated. This is what people say in algebraic geometry, um, but I'm gonna say it just because it's shorter. That's really the only reason. And I, I never need the notion proper and separated separately. So for me, proper means proper and separated. And one, there are many definitions of this, but one that's convenient for today is that uh, it's, it's also a kind of unique lifting property. It says that it's something about lifting the convergent points of ultra filters. Uh, I'm not going to explain exactly how this works, but I will, uh, I will tell you that this is equivalent to the sort of standard definition of uh, a proper map being as one that's universally closed and a separated map as one having a, a closed diagonal. Uh, and on this side, the basic examples, instead of open embeddings, they would be closed embeddings. And instead of maps from a discrete set to a point, they would be maps from a compact house door space to a point. And so the properness corresponds to the compactness and the separatedness corresponds to the, the house doorness. Now, before we saw that local homeomorphisms, they lifted generalizations uniquely. And in a dual sort of way, proper maps lift specializations uniquely. So if I have a point in Y and in X, I have a specialization of its image, then that specialization has to lift uniquely to Y. Um, and actually it's just an instance of the definition that I went over very quickly because a point Q specializing to a point P is the same as the principal ultra filter on Q converging to the point P. Um, and so really it's just an instance of the definition I gave before. So, you should keep this uh, or this lifting property for uh, specializations in mind and sort of the prototype of the definition of what a proper map is. Now, next, I, of course, I would like to look at proper maps to the Shapinsky space and try to understand what those should look like. And I realized as I was making these slides, uh, I never actually checked that all these statements on this slide are true, but I believe they have to be true. Um, and so let me just assume them for now and explain why I think they're true. Uh, so I claim that giving a proper map from Y to S, it's the same as giving two compact house door spaces and a map, but the catch is the map goes the other way than it did before. So if you go back three slides, um, a map to a, a local homeomorphism to the Sierpinski space, it had a fiber over the closed point, a fiber over the open point, and a map from the closed fiber to the open fiber. And the fibers were sets. In this new situation, we're going to have a fiber over the closed point, a fiber over the open point. They have to be compact house door spaces because the map is proper. Uh, and there's also going to be a map between them, but the map goes the other way. It goes from the open fiber to the closed fiber. And you can see that this has to be how it works because, well, for one thing, that's what we saw happens with specializations. So for every point in the open fiber, because there's a specialization in, or yeah, a specialization in S, that has to you lift uniquely to some specialization, and that's going to be, you know, sending a point to its specialization in the closed fiber is the map that's contained in this arrow up here. Um, you can also just check that, you know, a closed, the, the inclusion of the closed point is a closed embedding, so that's a proper map, and so that would be the diagram that's like one at the closed point and empty at the open point, and so the map has to go this way, it cannot go the other way. Um, so this is sort of supporting the idea that you know, there's some kind of duality going on between local homeomorphisms on, on one hand and proper maps on the other hand. Um, and this would be the construction. If I have a, a map of compact house spaces, then we should build a, a mapping cylinder out of it, but where somehow I glued the other end. So before I glued, uh, I glued A to B using the function from A to B at the open end, but now I'm gonna glue 
uh, really B to A using the function for B to A at the closed end. Uh, and the reason I believe these statements is that there is a recent paper of uh, Simon Henri and Christopher Townsend that proves this for um, in the setting of Topoi. So they show that a compact Hausdorff locale in a pre-shift topos is the same as uh, a diagram of compact Hausdorff spaces, but here the, the direction of the arrow is reversed. Okay, so that's, uh, if I summarize all this story, we see that there's a, it, 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 it was, it's sort of an analogy, but it's also a functor. So I can send a topological space to its points equipped with the specialization order. That's a pre-order. And it's gonna do the following things. So first of all, we have the Sierpinski space. It's got a close point or an open point. And it's gonna go to like the arrow as a category or as a post set with the point zero and one, or as suggested earlier, bottom and top respectively. And then it's also gonna send open subspaces or inclusions of open subspaces to upwards closed subsets because we saw before open subspaces were upwards closed under those relation, under the specialization order. Dually, it's gonna send closed subspaces to downward closed subsets. Uh, but moreover, it's gonna send local homeomorphisms of topological spaces to what I guess I'm gonna call left vibrations of post sets. And I just mean something that has that orthogonality property we saw before. And dually, we're gonna send proper maps of topological spaces to right vibrations, which are the things that have the opposite, the lifting property with respect to the other endpoint of the interval. And so this is at least some kind of motivation that suggests that there's some analogy between topological spaces, local homomorphisms with proper maps, and pre-orders and left vibrations and right vibrations, or if we sort of allow ourselves to generalize a bit, maybe categories or infinity one categories and left vibrations and right vibrations. And so that's the sort of uh, analogy that I'm, we're trying to explain through this directed, um, uh, directed univalence of condensed sets. Um, but one problem that we have so far, we're using topological spaces. If I have a post set, a left vibration of a post set, I know it's classified by the category of sets. So to give a left vibration over a post set is the same to give a functor from that post set to the category of sets, like a covariant functor. And if I had a right vibration, it would be going to set up. And so I'd like something on the left-hand side, like some kind of thing that would classify all the local homeomorphisms. So that to give a local homeomorphism to a topological space X is like, you have a continuous map from X to something like the space of all sets. But it seems pretty clear that uh, for various reasons that there cannot be a topological space of sets like this. First of all, because well, sets have automorphisms, so I would need to account for automorphisms. And, and also just because how would you define like a topological space of all sets or a topological space of all compact house spaces. And so that's another reason that motivates uh, replacing the category of topological spaces with something else. And we're going to see that we can do this if we replace uh, it by the category of condensed sets. And so that's going to uh, connect to where we want to go next. So now let's switch gears and talk about condensed sets. And I'll probably write cond instead of cond kappa some of the time. Uh, it just means I'm lazy and didn't include the kappa. And again, I've given you definitions. I don't really want you to try to understand the definitions. I just wanted to put them on the slide because uh, to illustrate that, um, well, first of all, they're, they're sort of short and sensible looking definitions. And secondly, that they don't explicitly invoke any topology. So of course, there's this tight relationship between condensed sets and topology, but I didn't need it to write down the definition of an atoll map or the definition of, especially the definition of a proper map. Okay, so these are just gonna be some notions that I claim are good and analogous to the corresponding notions for topological spaces. So now I claim that just by doing this, I've sort of solved that problem from a moment ago, is that in the sense that there is a, something at least that classifies uh, atomorphisms of condensed sets with, with a prescribed target. So if I have a, my favorite condensed set X, then I could look at, let's say the groupoid of all atoll morphisms of condensed sets to X. And that's gonna be the same as the maps of condensed groupoids from X into some condensed groupoid call, that I'm gonna call et. And the same, the same thing will happen also for proper maps. And this is really not a very, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's a pretty simple statement really. It comes down to the fact that the property of being atoll or proper, uh, we have to check that it's stable under base change and that it's local, it's a local condition on the base. Um, and once you have those conditions, then 
you can just carve out inside the stack of all the, the codomain vibration. Essentially, you can carve out the maps that are a taller proper, and you're going to you're going to get another stack. Um, and so I'm going to call these stacks at NPR. Okay. And so the next thing is that if MySpace X happens to be coming from topology, so if it happens to be a compact house space, let's say, then really uh, I didn't change anything uh, with one very minor detail. So any tall map to X, it turns out to be just the same as a local homomorphism to X. So if you like, it's also the same as a sheaf on X. And a proper map to X is just the same as a proper map to X in the sense of topology, except that I need to deal with this cardinal kappa. So I don't have all compact house spaces. I just have the ones that blah, 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 something involving kappa. So I'm just going to sweep that under the rug and just redefine compact house space if it becomes necessary. And, and so we can think that maybe we succeeded in our goal to some extent. So now we have uh, a kind of space, a kind of object of some kind, in particular, a condensed groupoid uh, of, of all sets, and which we call et, and another one a space of all uh, compact house door spaces that we call per for proper, I guess. And it is really the space of all sets in the sense that giving a map from X into this thing et is the same as giving a tall map to X. Okay. And so particularly the fibers of, you know, the global section of, of et, the stack really is the groupoid of sets. And the global sections of PR is really the groupoid of compact house door spaces plus some condition involving kappa. Okay. So, yeah. So that's the summary of the semantic side of the story. Um, we have a category of condensed sets that is a replacement for topological spaces. It's a topos. Um, but it, like topological spaces, it has these good classes of maps, uh, which we're calling a tall and proper. And they're going to be related somehow to lifting conditions involving um, this directed path structure that comes from the Stropinski space. And unlike in topological spaces, we can say that there are condensed groupoids that represent that represent the you know atoll maps or proper maps or that classify these things. So you can think of also et is like a, a fancy version in topological spaces. One thing that we could classify at the very beginning were open subspaces. Well, an atoll map that's a monomorphism that's an open subspace. So et is really just like one level up. But if you look at the propositions in et, they're just going to be open subspaces. They're going to be classified by the Sierpinski space. What we've done is kind of moved up one level so we can classify uh, atoll families, families of discrete sets rather than just families of open propositions. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, reformulate or describe the situation uh, from a type theoretic perspective. And uh, I want to acknowledge first that, you know, what we, some of our influences, so we were really trying to, well, originally Johan and I were trying to do something else, which is as it often goes. And one thing that you know, we were reading about was the synthetic topology that's been developed by Martin Escardo and uh, by many other people, including Andre Bauer and various of their students, and also a little bit of synthetic domain theory and abstract stone duality uh, of Paul Taylor. And this really influenced our thinking quite a lot. And I'd say the, the main distinction is that in synthetic topology or in synthetic domain theory, for that matter, you postulate like the object, which is like the Sierpinski space, so the classifier for open propositions. And in our setting, we replace it by just the classifier that's going to classify this thing at. So the classifier for discrete, for very tall maps or for discrete spaces rather than just for open. Because in our viewpoint, it's somehow the more fundamental object. And the other thing that we do is we add, we're going to add a classifier for these proper maps. And we'll see why in a moment. Uh, and I also want to mention a recent project called Synthetic Stone Duality. Uh, which is basically by the makers of synthetic algebraic geometry, um, which ends up, it has a different kind of perspective on, you know, maybe what it's trying to do to some extent. Uh, in particular, it talks about stone duality a lot more, um, but it ends up being very closely related to what we're doing. And so there's a lot of connections between those two uh, setups. So what is our setup? So here we have some type theory, finally. I'm going to assume that we have a univalent universe of zero types. Um, at the moment, Let's not worry about uh, trying to describe condensed groupoids and just try to think about condensed sets. So I've got a universe that's going to be the sort of, it's semantically the codomain vibration of the topos of condensed sets. Uh, and so its elements are going to be zero types, uh, but I want it to be univalent. And I can do that because, well, U itself will be a condensed groupoid. Uh, and so internally, U will be a one type. And I want it to be closed under all sort of standard type formation uh, constructions. And now, semantically, in 
the universe in, in condensed sets, I had these two classes of maps. Well, a, a class of maps in, in the semantics really corresponds to, if it's a good enough class of maps, like if it's a, it corresponds to a subuniverse of the universe of types. Um, namely, you know, a type in context is a map, and so a type in context belongs to a subuniverse if the map is, of, you know, in this case, a tall or tall. Um, and so we call these ODISC and Seahouse, and I think these names, ODISC comes from maybe abstract stone duality or locality or something. So it stands for overt, discrete, and maybe it's not the best name, but uh, it's sort of stuck. So formally, we're thinking of these as uh, propositions or predicates on types, but in practice, we're just going to write A colon ODISC. It, that, means just, that, that means, of course, A it really is a type, but it's one that is ODISC. Um, and the same for C house. And the way that we intend to interpret these is that the ODISC universe is classifying almost the atal maps from before. Um, but there's another condition which I didn't mention, which is that I, want, I need my maps to be kappa small, uh, which I didn't define. But you can think of it as if atal maps is the sort of the universe of all sets, then the kappa small atal maps, those are really just the kappa small sets. So in particular, like the global sections of ODISC will be the kappa small sets. Um, that's so. They might think that's because well, ODIS was too large before. Uh, but that's not actually the reason. The reason is that once we impose start imposing axioms on ODIS, we're going to have an axiom that says that like products of things, it, products of things indexed by ODIS types are well behaved, and that's only going to be true if the ODIS things are like kappa small sets. Because when we built con kappa in the first place, we only used kappa small cofilter limits of finite sets. So we only kind of control the kappa small limits. So this is kind of a subtle point that you can ignore safely, but th there is a reason to do this, which is an interesting reason. Uh, and then secondly, the compact Hausdorff universe, that's going to classify these proper maps. So you can internally think of ODISC as sort of the universe, the subuniverse of all sets, meaning discrete things, not spaces. Um, and C house is the subuniverse of compact Hausdorff spaces. And the theorem we prove is that we're going to list a bunch of axioms and they all hold for this interpretation. Uh, so what are the axioms? I've divided them into three slides, I guess. The first is uh, I call sort of formation axioms. Of course, they're not technically formation rules or anything. They're just axioms. But they look similar to what you would write as formation rules if you thought that like A colon O disk was actually a judgment. Or so. So then it would be a formation rule for that judgment. Um, so the first one is that these two subuniverses, ODISC and C-house, each of them is closed under all the kind of positive or covariant type forming operations uh, that we have in our universe, namely like finite sums, finite products, sigma types, formation of identity types, and formation of quotients of equivalence relations. Um, and the second one is that ODISC and C-house are also closed under pi types, but indexed by the other one. I, I guess I probably should have written out what I mean by that, but I mean, if I have a pi type like pi a colon a b of a, and I want to know if it's O disk, I need b to be O disk, and I need a to be C house. And the same, the other way around as well. And the idea with these first two axioms, or one thing to notice, I mean, first of all, these are just true facts about condensed sets and proper maps and so on. But one thing to notice about these first two axioms is that they look similar to the kinds of uh, rules that you would expect to see in a directed type theory, right? If I imagine that an O disk thing is like, something that depends, depends covariantly on some parameter, and a C-house thing is like something that depends contravariantly on that same kind of parameter, then these rules would tell me how to combine O-disk and C-house things correctly. And so that's even just formally, like in terms of the forms of the rules, uh, that's an analogy between what we're doing and, and sort of you know maybe directed type theories that are intended to be thought of as models for categories or you know, left and right vibrations of categories. Yes, exactly. As Emily has pointed out, this the second rule is uh, expressing the push forward of left vibrations along the right vibration as a left vibration and things like this. I think that's what you wrote. Yeah, perfect. Um, and the last uh, formation rule that we have, that is a little bit special to our situation, the natural numbers type. We know, of course, that should be discrete, and so it belongs to O disk. We also know it's not supposed to be compact, so we don't have a rule that says it's C house. Okay, that's more topological minded. Uh, the next axioms we have are these collection axioms. I don't really want to talk about them too much, uh, except to say that th we, you know, we found them in 
well, actually, Shwayan Mordike's paper on uh, a completeness theorem for open maps is the name of the paper. Uh, and we realized that, first of all, they could be true and then turned out to be true in our setting. And then we also realized that they're very useful. And I feel a little bit awkward. I don't know how to explain really why they're true or why they're useful, but they are. So um, really, it's kind of like this, this collection axiom, it, it serves often as a replacement for choice. So we don't, of course, have a, like a you know, general axiom of choice because the logic is not uh, going to be Boolean in this setting. But it turns out that this axiom kind of can paper over the lack of choice in a lot of arguments. And in the synthetic stone duality, uh, the synthetic stone duality group, they've been calling this kind of axiom local choice, which I think is uh, you know, in the same spirit as that. Uh, but I just wanted to include these axioms for completeness because probably they're used for it in the proof of a theorem or something. Okay, and finally, I've written the continuity axioms in a, in a different way if you've seen me talk about this uh, before. Um, and this is sort of the most, well, one of the more powerful versions of the axiom that just tells you what you really want to know up front. And, and it's, it's also something that's very uh, topologically flavored. So uh, by sort of this pi rule, the formation axiom for pi types, uh, when I say the HOM functor, I just mean the functor like HOM AX equals parentheses A arrow X. So just internally, it's just given by the, the function type. Um, but I'm writing it as a sort of functor uh, so I can restrict it to uh, the first argument being compact Hausdorff, the second argument being ODISC, and I know by the pi formation rule before the result is ODISC again. Okay, and then the axiom marked by this triangle is that this HOM functor, it commutes with certain kinds of colimits in each variable separately. And the kinds of colimits it commutes with are the ones that are indexed by categories that are first of all filtered, and secondly, internal to ODISC, meaning the objects of the category form an ODISC thing, and the morphisms also form, or the arrow, I guess, they also form an ODISC type. Um, and so one way to just think about this is they're just the discrete categories, as opposed to some weird topological categories that you would also have in the setting. And so that's the meaning of ODISC filter colimits. You could think of it as being sort of like the external colimits. If I think about condensed sets externally as a topos, then that has external colimits indexed by ordinary categories, and that's sort of analogous to these ODISC filtered colimits. And so the axioms say that, uh, well, right, so HOM commutes with both colimits in each argument separately. So this first axiom is sort of expressing the compactness of X. Mapping out of X, it commutes with some filtered colimit. So that's kind of compactness axiom. That's good. X is, X is compact. The second axiom says that mapping into an ODISC thing out of an inverse limit now of compact cultural spaces uh, well, any such function basically is determined by its, like, it, it's, it just factors through some finite stage of that diagram. And that, that's also some kind of uniform continuity property that uh, it can only possibly be true if A is discrete. Uh, and, and so this is something that's maybe a little bit less obvious, but it, it turns out to be, uh, again, very useful. And there's another way to formulate this involving, uh, there's a dependent version of this axiom uh, I don't want to get into. Okay, so this is the complete list of axioms we have. These formation axioms, uh, how, do, how do I prove that a type is Odisk or Seahouse? We have these somewhat mysterious collection axioms. Um, and finally, we have these two, these two continuity axioms about um, mapping out of compact things into co-limits or mapping out of a limit of compact things into, it, into a discrete thing. OK, so this is the context in which we're going to uh, state, and not today, but you know, this is what we've done, is prove a directed unibalance uh, theorem. So let me start with the statement. Um, and let's think back to where we started with the uh, Sierpinski space and talk about the two kinds of roles that the Sierpinski space uh, plays. First, as uh, the classifier of open subsets. So in our type theory, that's going to be sort of the, the analogous thing we say. I look at the classifier of open propositions. I'm going to call that O prop. So it's just uh, O disk intersect prop, if you like. And, and the other role that the Sierpinski play space played was that it was this sort of universal specialization that I could use to probe the specialization order of other topological spaces. And so with that idea, I'm going to think about O prop as the kind of directed interval. And as pointed out earlier, it's directed from the bottom proposition or the false proposition, which is going to be open to the top proposition, which is also open because there's the unit type and the empty type. 
And so with that idea, I can define if I have any type in my type theory, not necessarily belonging to this uh, universe. It's, it doesn't have to be a zero type. It could live you know, anywhere. And if I have two uh, inhabitants of that type, I'm going to define a type of directed paths from P to Q uh, using this here, this O-prop as the directed interval and using bottom as the uh, or the false proposition as the sort of starting point. So I ask that it gets into P and using top as the, the right end point. So I ask that it gets into Q. Okay, and so I'll just explain that here. Semantically, this would correspond to like on global sections, maybe just looking at maps from the Schrapinski space into your condensed set or your topological space if your condensed set happens to be coming from a topological space. Okay, um, but so that's a definition that you can make. Um, but there's a kind of caveat to this definition or something that you have to be aware of, which is that uh, even though I called this the inhabitants of these things directed paths, it's not the case in general that I can propose two directed paths and get a longer directed path. Um, so if I have a directed path from P to Q and one from Q to R, there's just no reason to think that there's a directed path from, Q to, from P to R. And a counterexample that you can build is just take two copies of the Sierpinski space of a condensed set and then just glue the open point of one to the closed point of the other. That's sort of the, the spine of the two simplex, but realized as a condensed set now. And it's, it's not this, it doesn't, there's no path at all from the closed point to the open point. Um, so you're just stuck. And that is a respect in which um, if we, it, it's better to think of condensed type theory or in condensed sets and condensed groupoids and so on as more analogous to uh, simplicial type theory and simplicial sets and simplicial group boys or simplicial spaces or whatever. Um, because also a simplicial space or simplicial set doesn't have to have compositions, right, for, for, for one simplicies. It's only special simplicial sets that do, the, you know, quasi-categories or whatever, or uh, Siegel spaces, depending on, you know, your approach. Um, so that's, this is what I meant at the beginning when I said the analogy between condensed sets and topological spaces, it kind of has to be taken sort of like it's sort of lying over somehow the analogy between simplicial sets or simplicial spaces and uh, post sets or categories in, or infinity one categories. There, there's a mismatch between condensed sets and topology, which is the same type of mismatch as between simplicial spaces and infinity one categories. And one, I have a, my, my speculation is that we're sort of stuck with this because, you know, in our original type theory, we had like this, this universe U and it was just closed under everything, including like all possible pi types we could want. And maybe, you know, that's also the case in some special type theory. Uh, I, as far as I know, it's not typically the case in uh, directed type theories. Usually you would only allow certain kinds of pi types and things like this. And certainly the, the you know, infinity one category of infinity one categories is not locally Cartesian closed and, and so on. So I think there's a relationship of sort of trade off here. If you want to have a general universe closed under everything, Maybe you're forced into this kind of simplicial or like the situation where the paths don't necessarily compose. But I don't know for sure. This is just, this is just seems like how things ought to be. Okay, so with that caveat, uh, here is uh, the statement of our directed univalence theorem. It says that if I have any two ODIS types, I can look at the directed paths uh, from A to B, meaning functions from O prop into O disk that send false to A and true to B. And that's equivalent to the type of functions from A to B. And the purpose of everything that came before was to try to make this statement at least plausible semantically in the intended model, um, maybe on global sections or something. So let's try to do that. So let's take this left-hand side, so paths from A to B, and si just sigma it up over all points A and B. And so altogether, we're just looking at uh, just a function of just a general path from O prop to O disk, or a function from O prop to O disk. Well, we know what the universal, the, you know, O disk is supposed to classify atoll maps. So a global section of this type that has to correspond to an atoll map over the Sierpinski space, or I guess maybe a kappa small atoll map if we're being careful. Um, and we also know that I said that atoll maps of condensed sets, they correspond to local homeomorphisms of, of topological spaces. Um, so we should also be able to replace this with just a local homeomorphism over the Sierpinski space. And then we, but we saw earlier, like we drew pictures of what those were. They're just sheaves over S and they're just the same as morphisms of sets um, where the close point we called, you know, the, the fiber of the close point we called A and the fiber of the close point we called B and the data of 
uh, the, the sheaf was just a map from A to B. And so then if we just reverse this, well, morphism said is it's two sets in a map. And so the global sections of this type is, well, the global sections of O disk, those are sets. So I get two sets in a map. So this is the kind of, so then I proved that externally, I proved that the global sections of the sigma of this thing are the same as the external global sections of the sigma of this thing. So that's supposed to sort of make you believe that such a statement could be true. Um, but the, as, I, uh, as it says here, it, this is not an external theorem at all or an axiom or anything like that. It's a theorem, but proved from those axioms, those nine or whatever, I don't know, axioms that I listed before. Um, and I wanna say, maybe how much time do I have left? Okay, great. I wanna say just a few words about the proof. I, I can't really go through much detail about the proof, but I do wanna like put it in a little bit of context, I think. So if I think about, well, ordinary univalence, first of all, ordinary univalence is in book hot, not something we prove at all, but let's just consider the statement of it. Um, that says for any two types in the universe, the equality, the type of equalities, the identity type of the universe is equivalent to the type of equivalences. And there's always a map from the type of equalities to the type of equivalences, right? Because I mean, if this equal sign is defined as a, as an inductive type, then I use the recursion principle. I reduce the case where I have A and A and I have an identity isomorphism between or equivalence between A and A, so I'm done. Or in cubicle type theory, it's built into the syntax somehow, right? There are these transport operations and A equals B, well, I mean, there's, it's more involved in this, but this is, I mean, it's somehow you get it from the ability to transport across equalities of types. But in our setting, this ODISC thing, it's not, uh, first of all, it's not a kind of inductive type. It's a classifier, it's a sub-universe. So actually it's, that sort of looks very different. Um, so I don't have a kind of induction principle that would, I didn't, I mean, I didn't postulate any kind of induction principle that says, well, in any family of Otis types, you have a kind of, if you have a value at A, then you have a value at B. There's no principle like this. Um, and, and which is the kind of thing you would need to define a function like this. Uh, and there's also no map, no obvious map in the other direction, which I guess is like, even here, there's not an obvious map in the other direction. So defining the map in this direction is, it's, it's gonna be related to the problem of well, if we try to think of ODISC as an inductive type to construct its recursor, that would be the, the thing that you would want to construct this direction. Uh, I wanna talk instead about building the other direction. So if I'm given a map, like we had a picture of before, G from A to B, how do I build the ATOL map to, you know, to ODISC in this case? Um, so, well, this is a lot of text. So yeah, so this is the setup. I'm given a function between two Otis types, and I want to build a path in this universe of Otis types that goes from A to B, the directed path. So just recounting what I just said, we could think if we were in an empty context, and just let's think about semantically or externally, um, G would be like an actual function between two actual sets. And then the appropriate thing to do would be uh, to build this thing where we had all those arrows and the, the you know, the, we had a copy of A, we had a copy of B, and we built a kind of mapping cylinder, which I've written here. So we take A across the interval and we glue it on the open end, yeah, to B. And that sits over S by just everything projects to S. Um, if you work out how to write it down in type theory, this, this, this construction involves here a push out. And if you try to formulate it in type theory, then you can construct it using the join of types here. So this, this mapping cylinder, it also projects, as well as projected to S, projects to B. And then if you look at the fibers of the map to do, I guess, um, S cross B, then you can work out that the fiber over a given B is like given by this part after the sigma. So this is the formula for the, uh, the directed path that goes from A to B. And so this join here is the push out of, here P, in our case, it's always gonna be a proposition. So it simplifies things a bit. The, the join here is the push out of those two maps, the two projections from P cross C to P and C. Uh, one thing you can read off pretty easily is if P is bottom, then uh, let's see, a join of P with C is just gonna be uh, C, I guess, because P is bottom and P cross C is also bottom. So all that's left is C. And so that's saying, if I plug in P here, I'm give, supposed to give you an element of B and then I don't, joining with bottom doesn't do anything. So then I also have to give you an element of A and the element of A has to be the preimage of the element of B. So in the end, I just gave you an element of A, really. 
Uh, on the other hand, if P is uh, true, then P cross C is just C, and so this push out all simplifies to true. And in that case, I'm giving you an element of B plus nothing, because this whole thing here is the unit type. And so that, that shows that gamma of, of true is, is B. And so indeed, we at least got a path that had the correct endpoints. That we can just see that. I mean, that didn't use any kind of uh, special feature of our theory. That's just a formula you could always write down, I guess. Um, but there's, I learned recently from a talk that Emily Real gave um, that there's, and but it must be, you know, I, I'm assuming that this was like out there and I'm just not aware of it, um, that there are really two different constructions that you can make. Uh, here's the construction I wrote down uh, on the first line. For, I take a sigma over B of the join of P with this pre-image under G of the little B. And a second construction is the, the sigma over B of, instead of taking the join with P, I take the, the uh, I take the, uh, I take not P arrow, whatever. Um, and it would, it's actually super convenient to know that these two are the same. And I think we use it in like one version of our proof of directed univalence. And so I've isolated that as a lemma here. If I have an open proposition and an Otis type, there's always a map from the join to not P arrow C because, well, not P, then we saw P join C is just C. So that's the map. And that map is an isomorphism. Um, it turns out to be just if you apply the continuity lemma from before to like a very well chosen diagram, it, it just is this statement. Um, so I don't know how useful it is to see that, but it's sort of interesting. Um, so I wanted to point this out because I know that other people have thought about this relationship between these two types. And this is also a relationship that exists in our setting and we can prove it from something else internally, but I don't know if the something else extends to other settings. Okay, so I would like to wrap up now. Um, I guess the main point of this uh, talk and for me speaking about this is to try to explain that, and I don't think this is at all controversial or, or, or unknown, but just to reiterate maybe that directedness, the idea of directedness and directed type theory and directed univalence is not just about uh, things like infinity one categories. Uh, there are other kinds of objects out there that have sort of um, internal directed structure, if you will. And one example of that is um, this example of condensed sets or condensed groupoids and so on. And the question that I'd like to uh, ask to all of you, um, because I certainly don't know the answer, is just to what extent it, are these different settings of you know condensed sets or some pushable spaces or you know uh, other kinds of directed or some, you know directed type theories uh, to what extent are they the same and can we fit them into one one framework that um, doesn't involve like you know Johan and I re rediscovering this fact that that maybe some other people knew like five or ten years ago or whatever is there a common framework for these subjects that um, that puts it all on it, on it. Because there certainly seem to be many similarities and even some parts of the arguments that are identical and reused. So I don't know the answer to that. That's why I wanted to speak about this today. Um, and so thank you all for listening. Great, thanks very much, Reed. We'll do our traditional silent applause or you can use the, uh, the reactions. And Reed has finished exactly on time. It's remarkable. Nice. Uh, we have our uh, our period now for questions. Lots of time for questions. So please just unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question, or uh, you can put it in the chat if you're shy. Either way is fine. Um, I'll start out. So I'd I'd love to hear how the continuity lemma specializes to prove yeah. that result uh, that you just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. I'm not, so I can explain it verbally, but it would be easier to draw something, but I'm not yet set up for that very well. Okay, so the lemma was something like uh, uh, P is in O-prop. Yeah. P is in o I, so I have it on my screen, so I can just tell you. So okay. P is O-prop, yeah. C is O-disc. And I look at the map from the join to the, like, mm -hmm not P arrow C. Is an equivalence or something, yeah. And then, yeah, that's what I want to prove in equivalence. Great. Okay, um, so I'm gonna consider the following diagram. Um, 
So you know like what a, a wide pullback is. Mm -hmm. right? So so yeah, so actually I guess I is gonna be the following diagram. I have an object, which is kind of like it's it's gonna be like a wide pushout diagram. I've got a a kind of cone point, and then I've got another mm -hmm. object for each mm -hmm. inhabitant of P. And I know P is a proposition, but just draw a bunch of dots and a curve Okay, trace so, so we have a cone point and then a whole bunch of dots. Yeah, a co-cone point, actually, yeah. Co-cone point. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, and there's P of the dots. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's I. Mm -hmm. And I claim, first of all, that's a filtered category, mm -hmm. uh, even though your picture doesn't look very filtered. Um, and the reason is, well, if I look at, so first of all, I is inhabited because it has the cone point. Mm -hmm. It's a pre-order, so that's fine. If I look mm -hmm. at two, two objects of I, well, either they're both the cone point, in which case they're bounded by the cone point, or one of them is like the inhabitant of P, and then it bounds the other one. But what if they're two different inhabitants of P? Uh, but P is a proposition, so that can't Oh, P be. is a proposition, I see, I see. Yeah. Uh, so because yeah. P is a proposition, okay. Yeah, good. Okay, now here's the diagram, X from I op to C house. Mm -hmm. It's gonna send sends the, the, the cone point to, uh, to one and all the other points to zero. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it goes, the, the maps, yeah, they go the other way, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and now A is, is, uh, is C. I mean, in the axiom. So the axiom now says that If I look right, at so let's recall the axiom. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the axiom says that hom from the limit of over I op of a bunch of compact health row spaces mm -hmm. into A. Into A, yeah. That's the co-limit over I of hom from X I into A. Mm -hmm. So it's like a co-compactness of A. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing is I is O disk as well, because its objects are one plus P and its morphisms I, I don't know, mm -hmm. one plus P plus P or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can apply it. So let's calculate. Mm -hmm. So what is the limit of this diagram XI? Mm -hmm. So I believe it's just not P. Mm -hmm. Because they're all propositions. So the limit is just the conjunction of all these propositions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's like pi over p of false. That, so that's not p. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the left hand side, we have not p arrow c. This is a c. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So we have, okay. Okay. So that's good so far. And now we want to look at, we want to apply the functor hom into a to this diagram. Mm hmm. So that looks like A mapping to one P times. Mm -hmm. Right? Because home from one to A is A, home from, or C, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's like the wide push out of P copies of one over the base uh, C, which is A. Mm -hmm. and that's the join. Mm -hmm. So we have, yeah, so we have C here and then a bunch so it's the limit of yeah exactly and a bunch of points a bunch of points um, p of them yeah p. let's see so that's very mysterious to me why this worked but it does <laughs> right and i suppose this map goes in that direction uh the way yeah, it actually goes 
yeah, the map, the canonical map goes the opposite way that I wrote it. That's right. Okay. Uh, yep. Thanks. I would not have figured that out. <laughs> so. Yeah, we had a different proof originally, and then eventually we realized that this was uh, also available. Yeah. Let me open the chat again. Just yeah, All so right, I might. This is a relationship between the, the an open modality and a closed modality. Yeah. For the, for the complementary thing, and I don't know if there's any general theorems that say if P satisfies blank, then this is true. Uh -huh. It seems like you're relying on C as well, so it's not it's not true That's for right. all C. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Great. Are there more questions? Thanks for uh, being a good spirit and. <laughs> Live writing my explanation. Yeah, how do I close this? <laughs> so. <laughs> Take a screenshot first. Any more questions? We have lots of time. I guess I wouldn't mind seeing back in your slides if you could share your slides. Oh, I'll try. Right. So, uh, I mean, the, the the so in the statement of directed unit, I, I just missed the direction or the definition of. The kind of directed arrows yeah for the directed univalence can i see that again yes <laughs> sorry this is what i was asking about i'm a little confused still about precisely the relationship of oprop and the serpinski space i guess okay in the model let's say you know yeah so oprop i mean the the the, the relationship is that they're the same object um in the sense that so O-prop is a, a priori, it's a stack of groupoids, but because the types are propositions, it's really just a stack of, it's just a sheaf of sets. And it is the sheaf of sets that is the image of the Sierpinski space under the nerve. Um, because both of them, the value on some profinite set is the set of all open subsets. Great, that makes me a lot happier, so okay. thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and also if you think about it, um, or if you want to think about it, uh, or the analogy with the simplicial situation, um, you know, S is like the interval, no, sorry, it's like delta one, let's say. Um, and the only thing that affects the notation a little bit is that, um, well, the, the endpoints of delta one, they're just kind of like constants. They're, they're just it's called zero and one, but because O-prop really is the universal propositions here, they're just called false and true. And so we don't write like P equals one, we just write P. But you could write P equals true if you wanted, and the formulas would look even more the same. For P, for not P, you could write P equals zero. Okay, so you you're satisfied, Emily. I can't see. I now that I'm sharing, I can't see everyone's oh, faces, yeah. so I can't yeah, tell yeah, if she's yeah. giving me a thumbs up or something. Yes. Okay. Yes. Any last questions? All right. Let us nice talk. Thanks. thanks. Read again. And our next talk is in two weeks. It'll be Floris Van Duren. So I hope to see you then.